So the pest I'm going to be talking about today are the evergreen bagworms, or the species Theridopteryx ephemeriformis, which is a huge mouthful, so I'm just going to say bagworms for the sake of this presentation. And hopefully by the end of it, you guys will be able to identify bagworms in your landscape, learn a little bit about their biology, and through that you can learn about management of them as well. So identifying the caterpillars is actually relatively easy because as their name suggests, they uh, live in bags. And it's always important to ID before you treat in any integrated pest management system, or as they say, know thy enemy. And in this case, the enemy is a caterpillar. And bagworm caterpillars are covered in plant material. They make their bags out of plants um, from their host, sorry, excuse me, leaves from their host plant, um, as well as silk. And usually most of the time when you see a bagworm caterpillar actively feeding on a plant, you're gonna be able to see its head and its thoracic legs visible. Um, I've seen them described as kind of upside down ice cream cones, except the ice cream is a caterpillar in this case. And these caterpillars are kind of this dull brown color with a little bit of black and white modeling towards the head. But the caterpillars make these bags to provide protection and camouflage. So camouflage against potential predators such as birds, but also protection, protection against potential parasites, as well as protections against insecticides that I'll cover on a little bit later in this presentation. And they can have a whole slew of different hosts. So um, their major hosts include evergreens like pine, spruce, juniper, but they can also infest deciduous trees like oak, locust, sycamore, and even more. And these are a couple of interesting pictures of bagworms that I found. This top left picture over here is actually a bagworm on a soybean plant. So we're seeing it on soybean, we're seeing it on deciduous trees here, this one in the middle is just one that happened to tie off its bag on the side of a building. Here it is on um, an evergreen. And then this right one is actually a bagworm on a prairie grass. So they have quite a wide host range. And here's just a couple more examples. This left one is, I thought it was kind of a pretty looking bag on a locust tree. And then here's more of kind of what a naked bag would look like a little bit on a fence. So hosts include over 120 different species of trees and shrubs. So these guys are more on the generalist side of being an insect. They have many different hosts and that's including all ornamental conifers, all species of Christmas tree, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, caterpillars and, excuse me, so bagworms go through the same life cycle. They have caterpillars, they pupate in this cocoon that they use their bag for, um, and then they become adults. And this particular family of insect is really interesting, the family psychity, because the males and the females look extremely different from each other. Female bagworms are wingless, they're legless, and they kind of just look like a, what's the word I'm looking for, a maggot. And if you see a female bagworm, that's really rare because you'll have to um, dissect open their bags. So the female bagworms, because they're wingless, because they're legless, they're never going to leave that bag. So in order to see one, you'll have to dissect it open. Whereas the males are furry and they're this dark gray or black in color and seeing them is actually pretty rare too. A lot of the times you'll, um, since the males do leave the bag, sometimes you'll see an empty pupil case hanging out the end of a bagworm bag. And that just signifies that a male has left that bag. So they look really different from each other. And symptoms and signs of bagworms, bagworms in the landscape include brown spots on foliage, missing needles due to um, defoliation, and the easiest sign that we can notice are the presence of bags on our trees. So this is what early instar feeding damage looks like. Um, in this top left picture, you can actually see this really teeny tiny bagworm caterpillar eating a single needle on this evergreen. So that kind of gives you an idea of how small these first instars are, but the damage really adds up. So this bottom right picture is that early instar feeding and this left is feeding on a deciduous tree. And it adds up because not only do they cause this damage, 
but they cause this damage in mass. So this is a picture I took um, a couple years ago of just this shopping district here in Lincoln. And I happened to walk by and I thought, oh, that's a lot of bagworm plants. In fact, in this single picture, there's about 50 different bagworm bags in this picture. And so not only are they causing damage by feeding, but the caterpillars are gonna be getting larger. They're gonna be eating more, um, but they also cause this damage in mass. And that's why it's really important to monitor for bagworms in your landscape. And it's really important to treat if you do find that you have bagworms because yes, they can kill the tree and kill the plant. So this is what um, a couple of examples of an extreme bagworm infestation look like. Um, the tree has almost been completely defoliated and it's kind of hard to see in this bottom right picture, but this tree is just absolutely covered in bagworm bags, but it kind of just um, goes to show that they're very well camouflaged if you don't know what you're looking for too. And knowing the bagworm's life cycle is um, essential in management because timing is key, just like with many other insect pests that we, we encounter in our landscapes. In Nebraska, bagworms hatch in late May to early June. Um, this time frame is going to differ if you don't live in Nebraska because that their life cycle is entirely dependent on temperature. And in a, in a minute or two, I'm going to show you this cool tool that you can look at online that actually predicts when hatch will occur. Um, but when they hatch, they're these really teeny tiny caterpillars, as we saw earlier. And um, when they produce, when they hatch, they actually produce silk. So that's what they make their bags out of, but they can actually balloon. And so this means that when they produce that silk, it can catch the wind and therefore catch the caterpillar. And that's how they go from host plant to host plant. They just kind of migrate with um, by flowing on the wind. So when caterpillars are this small, it's also when they happen to be the most susceptible to insecticide tr insecticidal treatments, excuse me, because they're really actively feeding. Think the very hungry caterpillar, he's feeding and feeding and feeding and towards the end he slows down because he gets a tummy ache. So think small caterpillars are really, really hungry. And so they're actively sticking their head out of that protective bag as well. So this is that tool that I had mentioned earlier. It's a bagworm forecast. So the website is usanpn.org slash data slash forecast slash bagworm. It's kind of long, but you can just Google bagworm forecast and this should show up. And this website actually has different forecasts for several different insect pests, but it's really cool because it helps you predict when bagworms are going to emerge in your area. So this is a screenshot that I took yesterday and we can see here in eastern Nebraska, where I'm located, activity has already ended. So that means that bagworms have already hatched, they're already actively feeding. Whereas we get more towards central Nebraska, caterpillar emergence is just now happening. So it's a good time to really start monitoring. Where if about a week ago, the area might have been more of a green color, meaning that caterpillars are expected to hatch in seven or fewer days. And this is because this is based on temperature or degree days. So it takes so many degree days, as you can see in this, um, this legend here on the bottom right for caterpillars to hatch. So come um, late May, early June, you think, hmm, is it time to start looking for caterpillars? Is it too early? Am I past that window? This is a great tool that can kind of help guide you um, as you begin monitoring. So after caterpillars hatch in May through early June, they're going to feed for about eight to 10 weeks and through the month of July, and they're going to become much larger caterpillars um, until about the size, a couple inches of the bag. Both sexes pupate inside separate bags. So each individual caterpillar will make a bag and they'll pupate inside there. However, as they mature in August or September in Nebraska, the female will stay within the bag as a mature moth. But once again, she's legless, she's wingless, she's not going to be leaving. Whereas the male will mature and he will leave and he will search for a female to mate with. So he'll leave his bag, find and mate with females. And then sometime um, around October, the female is going to lay up to a thousand eggs in her bag before she dies. 
So we think about how many bagworms that we saw on those heavily defoliated trees. That's a thousand potential caterpillars happening, hatching out of a single bag. So really, um, this is why monitoring is so, so important. And then the life cycle starts all over again. So knowing their life cycle is really important because it's going to give us a management timeline. So um, in the fall and the winter and the spring is the perfect time to just get out there and cut and destroy any bags on the trees. This is an excellent way, um, an excellent control option because it doesn't involve any insecticides. You can simply go out there, cut off any bags, destroy them. You know, um, the easiest thing to do is to just put them in soapy water um, put them in a bag, put them in the trash, crush them, light them on fire, do safely, but do something to destroy them. Because remember, each of those bags has the potential to hold up to a thousand eggs. In May and June, so right now is a great time to monitor for caterpillars. Um, you can scout for emerging young larvae on the lower branches of the trees. Um, very early on in that late May to early June timeframe, because typically emerging larvae, after they leave their mother's bag, they're going to drop down to the lower foliage. And as they begin feeding, they're just going to gradually move up. So as you're scouting and monitoring for the caterpillars, start low and kind of make your way up and look for those teeny tiny upside down ice cream cones. And then in June, so if you've confirmed that you have a bagworm infestation on a tree or on a plant, we strongly recommend spraying a Bt-based product. So Bt is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterium that produces a toxin, and it kills specific insects, and in this case, Bt kills caterpillars. The caterpillars have a certain pH in their gut that activates Bt, which is why it's great for non-target organisms. You're not going to be negatively affecting your pollinators. You're not going to be negatively affecting um, your natural enemies like wasps, paras parasitoids, predators, things like that. Um, and it's most effective when used against the young larvae because the larvae, once again, are very hungry caterpillars and they must consume the Bt, the Bt on the plant itself. So when you're spraying this Bt paste product, Coverage is critical because you want the caterpillar to be able to eat it, and the timing is critical as well because we want to target these really small caterpillars. And then two weeks after any, um, two weeks is kind of the rule of thumb for your pesticide application. So after two weeks of your first application, you're going to want to monitor again, scout for caterpillars, and decide and determine if an additional treatment is needed. Um, and then late July, we would call these rescue treatments. So if you missed your early window and you have a bagworm problem, the caterpillars are more mature. Um, they're not eating as much, so the BT product might not, might not be um, as effective. You can use, um, we recommend spraying with a carbaryl or pyrethroid-based product. Um, another option um, towards the end of the season, more towards August, is pheromone traps are available for bagworms and they mimic the female's pheromone. So it traps male, male bagworm moths, which prevents um, mating, which prevents more eggs being produced. Um, that's obviously not going to be a silver bullet. Um, pheromone traps, I, I like to think them better as a, as a better monitoring tool than a um, management tool. But once again, in this late July, you can spray with a carbaryl or pyrethroid product. And there are several different types of products out there that are marketed for bagworm control. And here are just kind of more some of the more common ones that you can come across. So um, there are organophosphates like carbaryl or malathion, um, botanicals like azadiractin, microbials like Bt and spinosad. So spinosad is a second microbial, but it's more broad spectrum than Bt is, and it might have um, um, implications on non-target organisms as well. And then pyrethroids can include bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, um, and permethrin. And then I want to end this presentation on the note that um, I think my colleagues would agree that we get this question quite a lot if it wants to advance here. 
is it going to be a good or a bad year for bagworm? And the question is, is right now we don't really know. I will say that I have been going out looking for bagworms and I have yet to find any and it just might be a good year for us um, in regards to bagworms. And that's because bagworms are limited by freezing temperatures. Um, and so when temperatures fall below one degrees Fahrenheit for approximately 24 hours, and as um, people that are joining us from Nebraska know that we definitely had some very cold, cold snaps and we did reach that temperature range for more than 24 hours, then more than 75% of the eggs in the bag can be killed. So that's good. That means we might have less bagworms this year. That being said, 25% of 1,000 eggs is still 250 eggs. So it's really important to continue monitoring and looking for bagworms um, because we do have this kind of short treatment window. So I'm going to wrap up and I, we are happy to take any questions. And I'm just going to add this last slide to the screen for our future webinars if you are able to join us. Thank you all. Kate, a question did just come in to the Q&A, so I'll let you answer it. Um, can you see that or do you want me to read it? it? It just, it says, can you tell the difference between a bagworm bag that is empty and one that is active with live bagworms or caterpillars? So the ones that have live caterpillars are not going to be tied off on the tree quite yet. They're going to be mobile and moving. Bagworms that have pupated already or that are empty are going to be tied to the tree. And sometimes if you feel it too, if you can feel the bag, um, some of them just feel empty. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to give a little better answer to that. But generally, if you see any of the bags in the tree, just go ahead and remove it. Do we have any other questions uh, for Kate? You can type them in the Q&A or you could type them in the chat if you need to at this point. Kate, I do have to say that probably my favorite bagworm that I ever found was on a cedar tree and each, quite a few of them were not only decorated with the needles, but they were decorated with a little blue cone as well. And I've only seen one shelter belt where they did that. So I decided they were very artistic bagworms. They are, they're a pest, but their bags are really cool. One of our colleagues actually has some painted bagworm bags on this little tiny Christmas tree in her office. So she's using them as ornaments. I thought that was kind of neat. And if you didn't happen to notice, Jody Green um, commented that uh, sometimes the pupil case from the male moth will be hanging out of the bottom as a way to identify, but as she says, that's sometimes. Any comment on that, Kate? Yep, as I mentioned earlier, seeing the males is pretty rare, but um, I have a picture of it and I should have added, but if you see like this little brown exoskeleton hanging out the end of, um, of a bag that's been tied off and stuck to a tree, that's a male that has already left the bag, so it's empty. Mm -hmm. And we do have another question asking, is there a systemic that could be used on evergreens? Um, for bagworm, does any of my colleagues want to take that one? Uh, Jody yeah. says Dinotepheron. <clears throat> Sorry, Dinotepheron. So if you look in the chat and you're not wondering, if you're wondering how to spell that, if Jody has put it in the chat. And Deanne is asking, are new or young trees more susceptible? Ooh, that's a good question. Scott says you would like to answer this one live. I was trying to find the right button to hit. Um, but the new or young, I mean, uh, the backworms are pretty equal opportunity. Um, it's more where we see a high population of our, our evergreens. We might see some of our newly planted evergreens catch them early, but I don't think they favor one over the other. Okay, thanks, Scott. 
Um, and somebody, Diane is asking, is it possible to prevent bagworms on your trees if, for instance, your neighbor has them? So you can use that systemic, that um, dinotiferin that Jody had mentioned. Other than that, cutting the bags is going to be the best way to prevent them because, like I said, you know, they can migrate through the wind. Um, yeah. 